I just hear things that aren't there. But I have things like I should kill myself quite a lot. I have that quite a lot. Schizoaffective disorder, easiest way to describe it is schizophrenia and bipolar together. Um, so it's like the I have the hallucinations and the vid, like audio and visual side of schizophrenia as well as the up and down moods with bipolar. I tried to get help when I was younger before it because I started to I was like cause when everyone's like little they have like imaginary friends and stuff so I never really thought anything of it but it's only when I got to like 30 I thought it's a bit weird and I shouldn't really have this anymore so uh, I went to the doctors but they were like oh it's all hormones stuff you're just a teenager don't worry about your moods don't worry about everything it will just go in time so it's only really when I came down here to Portsmouth for uni that they decided to like run tests and stuff and see and yeah I got diagnosed last year. My parents are uh, it was tough for them. Um, like my mum always tried to get me, get me to go get help and stuff. And being like young, I was like, oh, there's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with me. She was keeping a lot to herself because she didn't want to worry us. So we didn't realise quite what was going on. And when we did find out how bad it was, it was quite scary, you know, it was quite frightening. We were there when she was in hospital one day, and uh, she was obviously very distressed and, and was sort of pulling lumps off the back of her hand virtually. And it was. Just frightening, really. Just, and you felt quite lost. Uh, you just didn't know what to do, really. At the moment, I don't have any like visual things. Sometimes I have. Um, the main thing I had was like shadows, kind of thing. It's like you, it's like a person is there, so like seeing them as clear as I can see you, but I can't. I can never see their faces. Um, it's kind of like shadow, like hooded face, kind of thing. And they will talk to me. Like I used to have one that would like follow me around everywhere. And I've like learned to ignore it now because like I know it's not real. But obviously when I was younger it was really really scary, and I think that people were following me all the time. But at the moment I just have like audio ones, so I just hear things that aren't there. I hear foreign voices as well. Like I don't even speak like any other languages like fluently, so it's really weird when I hear all these different languages, and it's just like what? Um, yeah, and it can be like good things and bad things. Sometimes it's just you know, like when you walk into a room, there's loads of people talking, and it's like loads of chatter and stuff. Sometimes it's just like that, and it makes no sense whatsoever and sometimes it can be specifically directed towards me so like I did have them before like I try and ignore them as much as I can now but when I was younger like I would do what they said because like they they would threaten me if I didn't do things but I learned to realise that their threats can't mean anything. I have things like I should kill myself quite a lot, I had that quite a lot um, I ended up um, stabbing my knee one time with a knife which is still scarred and really horrible because they said otherwise they'd I can't remember if something to do with my family, they'd hurt my family or something. We've, we've sort of go, rushed down here and... Or we'd, we'd be going to bed but waiting for the phone to go. Yeah. We thought at one time that that's, you know, we were going to have people ringing us up to say that they found her. And that type of thing, and that's, you know, and that was every day. It was, yeah, pretty much this time last year, October last year. And I was really, really bad. I wouldn't leave the house. I was terribly, terribly suicidal. Um, I was called into different, like I was taken into A&E quite a few times. I was put on a thing called a crisis team where people come and basically check on you every day. They give you your tablets once a day and in the evening so you don't overdose or anything. Basically like being babysat like when you're younger, it's horrible. And I realised I couldn't basically live my life like that. Like it was horrible. I do go through really horrible, horrible depressive stages where I literally, I can't be alone. People won't let me be alone at all because they're worried for myself. I had a bit where everyone thought I was a little bit crazy, like when I was a little bit younger, because I would talk to people when I thought they were genuinely there. Like I would happily sit and chat to this guy that was following me around or whatever. Like he could be in the back of my car, like when I was driving, kind of thing. And I would like sit and chat, and people, like if I just met new people, it'd just be like, oh, okay, what? Like it's really weird to proper creep people out about it. And like obviously it's quite difficult because when people think of you, it's a bit weird. <laughs> it's a bit. It's horrible. I take cotiapin, which is an antipsychotic and a mood stabiliser, and I take fluoxetine, which is an antidepressant. Um, yeah, they're really, really good. Like, especially the cotiapin, it helps you sleep as well. It's kind of like a sedative. So when I'm manic, I do not sleep. You know, um, I kind of refuse to take my medication. I think, like, oh, because I'm feeling good. I don't need to take it. It's all right. Um, but it's a really good thing, because then I finally get to sleep. And it's really, really helped me. I have stabilised my moods, and I feel actually all right. Course. It's only been like the past year or so. I thought that trying to talk to people would be like now. I think trying to talk to people is a lot better because I'm getting my voice out there and people can understand like 
why I'm like how I am sometimes. Like if I um, shut myself off from all my friends, my friends are so lovely and they understand if I don't speak to them for like a week or something, as long as they know they can check in and make sure I am okay, they, they're okay not to bother me and stuff. You notice differences in her personality at times because you'd swing every now and then. Like, um, she would go through like stages of manic and then um, depressive. It was kind of, um, you, you'd tell there was a change in her at times. If some, like, even just like walking to the shops and back or something like that, you won't see if anything's changed or nothing significant would have happened, but you can tell something wouldn't be right or something on the way back. It'd be like slightly different and you could tell. She's a really cool person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lively, very lively. Yeah. Never a quiet moment in this house. Never a quiet moment, never a dull no, moment. Definitely not. But also got one of the biggest hearts. Oh yeah. yeah. Like she's helped me through my mental health issues as well and some other people so she understands. Yeah. So when it does get serious, you know, she does sort of well, see want... that level. She's not all just a joke about it. Mm. But she's so much fun. I think that speaking out about it is definitely helping. It's, it's like I know quite a few people that I, I'm friends with who I never knew had any mental health problems have come out and said they have mental health problems and actually gone and got help since I've started speaking about it so I'm really really happy about that but I know there's still some people that are like maybe because one guy in the media some schizophrenic guy killed someone all of a sudden everyone thinks every schizophrenic guy is going to go kill you so yeah it's kind of horrible around that but I think talking about it's getting better um, but yeah I managed to go up because I was thinking it through I was looking from a diary and that and I've worked out that it's um, two months today since I last self-harmed, which is brilliant, really, seeing as I was doing it every day for, what, like, 11, 12 years? So, yeah, that's brilliant, really. Um, I guess I just wanted to show you, like, the tattoo I got as well, which has kind of stopped me from doing it. I got it when I come out of rehab, so, it's like, it's there. Um, and basically it symbolises the saying, a smooth sea never made a skilled sailor, which is what I kind of, like, relate my life to, because, like, my life hasn't exactly been smooth, but I'm still here nowadays. So yeah, I'm a little bit happier knowing that and that I'm actually on my way to recovery.